This is Merchandise Mart. Transfer to Brown Line Trains at Merchandise Mart. Yeah, bloopers. Hello. Doors closing. Uh, welcome to the Wisendell Weekly Wrap Up. Um, my second guest for 2020 with me today. Super excited. Go ahead, you can introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Emily Winter. And Emily, we met through the uh, Chicago Textile Week. We did. Um, you guys were hosting the uh, open house on the Sunday. And tell us a little bit about the space. Uh, well, that open house was a um, <clears throat> it was the kickoff party for Chicago Textile Week, and it was the hundredth birthday party for our pin warper, which is the uh, warping machine that we wind the warps on, and uh, it's a Davis and Ferber machine built in 1919 so it seemed only appropriate to um throw out a 100th birthday party very cool um but yeah so the weaving mill is um a small ish industrial weaving studio that is housed within a day program for adults with developmental disabilities gotcha and so the weaving mill in its sort of current incarnation grew out of the chicago weaving corporation which was a weaving Sorry. company um in chicago that started in the 1940s mm -hmm. and they did they were in wicker park and then in park ridge and they did um just like mostly table linens and napkins placemats runners tablecloths etc hmm. and they were going out of business in 2005 and the guy who was running the company linked up with envision which is a social services agency and they moved some of their equipment into the day program that nice. we're in now and then how many people yeah. excuse me yeah. how many people are with the envision program uh, Do you guys have a cap or is it uh well west town center has about it's kind of in flux but there's let's say maybe 60 people there every mm -hmm. day doing programs um but for the weaving mill, the way that we primarily interface with them is through the WEFT program, which is the West Town Education for Textiles, which is a punny acronym. Um, and I so like it's it. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, so that's a hand weaving program that we do with the folks in the building who are adults with disabilities. And there's like a rotating cast of like, hmm, I'd say like, you know, a class size can be as small as six, depending on what else is going on, and then as many as 12, but there's like a rotating group of about 30 people, I'd say, who are involved with textile programs. Gotcha. The mill. Yeah. Um, apologies, I feel like we jumped all the way to present. Let's go, I know. go all the way back. We yeah, didn't yeah, even, yeah. So we I, didn't I, I, I was back. just like, no, but you get me started yeah, on, <laughs> and I'm like, this story's deep in my DNA. But I do want to I'll find out more spiel. about the, uh, the whole, um, yes, the, we have the whole machinery. Nice time to talk about and, it. Yes, we, we do. We do. Um, so all the way back, you said you're okay. from San Francisco. I'm from San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. I'm from San Francisco. I grew up in San Francisco and then I moved to Chicago to go to college and I studied, um, history in college. But before that I'd been doing a lot of like more sort of fine art stuff and the high school that I went to was like a technical arts school and I did like we had an architecture program and I did metalworking and drafting and studio stuff and when I went to college I kind of put that part of myself mm -hmm. away for a while and mm -hmm. so when I finished college I was really itching to do more like hands-on material kind of stuff and so I started weaving where'd you go to college uh University of Chicago okay Great. yep nice yeah and then, um, did you live on the East Coast at a period of time? I, I did. So yeah. in 2013 to 15, I lived in Providence because I was going, doing a MFA program at RISD for oh, great. textiles. How was that? It was cool. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. It was good. It was like, um, it was pretty challenging in a lot of ways, but it was a really good opportunity to like kind of put blinders on you know mm -hmm. and just dig really mm -hmm. deep like into camp or something yeah. totally just yeah started, yeah yeah in. just like all weaving all the time and i'd been weaving for a couple of years but it you know i went back to school because i felt like i was ready to go deeper basically and yeah. so that's what it allowed me to do nice do you still yeah. have contacts from RISD or what, what are some other other classmates doing as well oh that's a good question um let's see people are doing a lot of different stuff um I feel like right out of school, a couple people went right into um, 
like design jobs with sh- like Nike, Converse, yeah. um, sort of sh- more shoe shoe like materials materials mm-hmm. research kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, a number of people have started their own things, which mm-hmm. is awesome. That is um, awesome. And yeah, a yeah. Range. I, was, I was just yeah. curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was yeah. just. I'm sure there's a range of yeah. people that go all over yeah. the place. Were you yeah. able to make it to the Museum of? Um, Science and industry for the no. textile of the future. Oh, no, man, that, I know. That was, I, I, that was, you missed the boat on that one. I <laughs> totally missed the boat. I'm it was ashamed. Pretty cool. It sounded really cool. Yeah. yeah. What were some of the. Um, there was a backpack that, that, that was pretty cool that, uh, like, for kids, and there was some visual um, technology on the back of it, as well as there was a space suit um, of the future. Uh, they were trying to cut down on the weight of the space suit. And um, it was more of like a compression fiber, I believe. Um, I could be botching that totally. But uh, it was very form-fitting and more of a compressed uh, material. But, yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, Okay, so 2000, when did you buy the... The, the machinery? Well, or when did you come, yeah. come across that? Yeah, so I started working at West Town Center. West Town Center is like a single story brick factory building in Humboldt Park that Envision has been running as a day program uh, for people with disabilities since the mid 70s. Mm. Um, and there's a really vibrant arts program there that was started by Monica Thomas, who's an amazing artist. And she hired me in like, 2011 maybe as her sort of teaching assistant Mm -hmm. and so I got to know West Town Center and the people there um, by working in the art program for a couple years and so the whole time that I was working there I was doing a lot of hand weaving and quilting and sewing and just kind of like general studio support and but also out of the corner of my eye being like what is over there? <laughs> what are those machines? This is nuts. So I'd like a look at them. And I got to know Jim, who was the guy who ran the company. Okay. And a couple of times, you know, he would like be like, well, so okay. that was just happenstance. Yeah. That it was there. Yeah. Really? I mean, it was, I mean, it's all, you know, whatever. Sure, all it's t- just intertwined. life. It's intertwined. Like, it's yeah. intertwined. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it's okay. a series of historical accidents. Yeah. AKA life. Well, but. <laughs> Yeah. So true. Yeah. So he, yeah. So the, the weaving company had gone out of business and moved like a real skeleton operation into this day program because they were like, you know, we can't really cut it. We don't want to cut it anymore as like, you know, as a sort of Chicago based weaving company, which makes a lot of sense to sort of compete in like the traditional or more conventional sort of manufacturing side. Um, so they moved this equipment into the day program so they could do a really pared down production line and then start a job training program with the folks in the building doing like the cut and sew and packaging work on their on their products Hmm. so they moved in there in 2005 and that went for several years and then by the time i got there and to the building in 2011 it had really petered out and um so there's yeah a couple years of me working there and kind of being like this is really crazy. What are these machines? Because they're industrial. It's like factory style weaving looms. Um, yeah. And there's a real wide age range, 1919 to like 2005. And I just hadn't had no sense that there was like that kind of industry in Chicago, even like everything yeah, I, I I've never yeah. I haven't seen it. I, I don't I know. know too much about the textile industry in Chicago. So I think it's um, it definitely did exist. Um, yeah. And I've been learning little bits bits and bits about it as well, I've even been working year, on this. Even last year with the uh, Bauhaus and the yeah. textile and the Art Institute and just knowing yeah. how uh, textile designers kind of influenced some of the textiles here in Chicago. I, I, I never knew that either. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, so that machine has, you, you guys were running a raffle for how many... Oh uh, yeah, how many holes? How many holes were in <laughs> How many holes were in, are in that? Do you know? Like, should have prepped me. Should have prepped. prepped me, Felix. <laughs> Could have looked it up. We counted. It was really cute because Kendall, who's the weaving mills, she's my assistant, right hand man, whatever. Yeah. She was like, we were sort of talking. We were like, we should uh, totally do this. Guess how many holes are in the pin warper? And then it's like, well, then somebody's gonna have to count them. Yeah. And she was like, I'll count them. And I was like, you can just count one and then multiply. She's like, no, no. I'm she counting. Yeah. I'm pretty sure she counted all of them. <laughs> So describe now, what the pin warper is for people who yeah, aren't familiar with that. It's like a giant cast iron cylinder that has a, the circumference of it is four yards. 
and it's a big measuring wheel for for winding out warps and so in weaving you have the warp which is the sort of vertical threads that go on the loom and in order to set up the loom you got to measure out all these threads keep them under tension and make sure that they're all a consistent length basically and Mm -hmm. so at the scale that we're working at we're winding warps that are between um, on the small side like 50 or 60 yards and on the long side like 400 yards damn and so you're just winding around as you you have there's a creel which is a big um spool rack that's next to the pin warper and then that's loaded up with all these spools of yarn and then they get pulled into a bundle and then that bundle wraps around the pin warper however many times you need to go in order to wind out the the warp length so if it's what what's the width if that's the length what's the maximum width you can get on one the, of those? the width or is it four uh no it's the width the width of the fabric is um we have two looms that use that warper and one of them weaves 60 inch fabric and mm. the other weaves uh, about 90 inch fabric so i guess when you're running at those lengths there's only select people that can buy some of that stuff. So where, where do the sales, not to get all deep, but where do sure. the sales from that or what type of companies are buying those type of, yeah. that, that, that size? Well, over the last couple of years, the, the, I'd say the, the weaving mill is kind of like a different beast every six months, it feels it? like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. agile. It's very agile, yeah. <laughs> uh, when we first started, so I started it, uh, my friend Maddie and I started it together, and she and I ran it for three about three years, um, and then she moved on about a year ago, and I've been running it. Mm-hmm. But so when I say we, in the first, first couple of years, we were doing a lot of like custom fabrication and design stuff, so companies like Unison Home here in Chicago or Rejuvenation, home um rebecca atwood um heron uh but so mostly sort of like smaller interiors brands or home goods stores Mm -hmm. we did like collaborative projects so they would we did commission us to do a addition of 100 throw blankets or Mm -hmm. yardage for pillows where is unison now i was on division it was on division they closed up the storefront a little while ago and so i think they've they're moving they're just not maintaining the storefront, but they're still around. Oh, they're doing. So they don't have brick and mortar. They're yeah, just, they're just doing catalog just and catalog. web stuff. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that that's interesting. Um, yeah. So did you guess on the pins? No. Okay. Three <laughs> thousands. I'm talking it's thousands. It's like I want to say it? it's like I want to say it's like thirteen, like one thousand. Doesn't seem very. I think maybe it was maybe it was actually like seven thousand. I yeah, feel like it was, it was like was seven thousand. Yeah, six hundred and thirty-four. Gotcha. But I wish that was something I had memorized. Sure. Yeah. But I and, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot about it. It's that, okay. So. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. But, but I know we have okay. a uh, hopefully a collaboration coming up in the next few months. So yes. I definitely want to get some uh, a work session over there to definitely to come out with stuff. I'm excited things. to work on so, some tote bags. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, what other? What do you do with the? Uh, products you make? You sell them on the website, or mm-hmm. do you sell them just directly at, off of the in your store or in the in space the, in the shop yeah. yeah um on the website and then do whenever we have open houses which happens sort of throughout the year uh, various um various times usually set up a little shop mm-hmm. um done the randolph street market the last couple summers which oh, has cool. been a fun opportunity to like get stuff into the world yeah um we do a big december in december we do a thing called the mill mart which is a like 10 day or so pop up uh that my friend um friend of mine's got this storefront on north avenue so we sort of take that over and nice. do a little retail pop up so december was busy for you then. december was busy uh, then yeah. Wh- yeah, yeah, you, yeah so you did a lecture not a lecture a presentation yeah. in december at the grand foundation yeah yeah what, did that coincide with your uh, pop-up or that no? was the day before the pop-up opened oh, that, was, really? that week was yeah, nuts wow. <laughs> <laughs> i was like well yeah cram it in yeah so how did um, you get involved with the grant what do you yeah. know more about the Graham foundation can you speak more on that too yeah yeah so the Graham the Graham foundation is a well it's a arts organization here in chicago that has a um physical location in the madliner house which is in i guess that's the gold coast it's like around it's sort of the the bottom end of lincoln park um but it's this beautiful, uh, like early 20th century mansion um, that's been 
repurposed into gallery space. And the Gram is like a, they fund a lot of projects around architecture and sort of the built environment research and artist projects. And then they do these, they have exhibition space and they have different artists showcase in their, in their galleries. And I got involved with them originally, um, uh, artist named Nelly Agassi, who I'd met through various little threads, um, <laughs> got in touch because she was a fellow there and was working on an installation and had, I think, in fact, had a dream about these curtains that would be installed in one of the galleries that would, you know, start in the windows and then just like keep going and mm. just fill the room of mm-hmm. the fill the room with these with these drapes. And so she got in touch with me to see if that was something that I'd be interested in working on with her, if I was able to. And I said, definitely. And so we worked on that last um, this time last year. And then I think that opened in the spring of last year. So got to know her. It was and like a long, gram. really long drape, right? Yeah. Sorry, not to cut yeah, you yeah, off. Yeah, no, it was yeah. three. Is um, and there's photos of this on their on their webs on the Graham's website. Um, but yeah, it was three window panels, and each panel was about 15 yards long. Damn. And so it really filled the space. It's a long, it's linear gallery, yeah. and um, yeah, Nelly had this really sort of lovely idea. A lot of her work was taking like um, elements from the architecture of the of the house itself and then mm. reworking them through embroidery and drawing and um and some sort of sculpture stuff and then these panels and so the motif on the draperies was taken from some of the iron work and like woodwork in the in the house gotcha. yeah very nice yeah yeah so that's how you linked up with that's how i linked up with them initially yeah. and then the next show that they did there was um by the tatiana bilbao studio which is architecture studio um local based in mexico city mexico city yeah, yeah and they do a lot of amazing amazing projects really expansive practice and they the bilbao studio was designing this installation as part of the chicago architecture biennial that was um really sort of anchored on this modular furniture system designed by the sweetwater foundation here in chicago and there were all of these sort of like participating collaborators that were creating other elements of the installation. And the idea was that over the four months or so that it was open, that it would be not so much an exhibition, but like a site for programming and activation and sort of, you know, modeling, mm-hmm. whatever ways mm-hmm. of being and programming. Yeah. And so anyway, so then they, part of that installation was seating cushions, pillows. Mm. And um, so the, Graham invited me to work on that, and I said I would love to, That's and awesome. so yeah, so created these little and then series of seating cushions. On your presentation, the it was the wool. I always get this incorrect. The wool. The wool buy. The wool buy. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. I was called the wool trail for some. some that for sounds some fun. That sounds like a thing but we it, could it do. It was like, like a. Map. a it, how many stops? Or I'm sorry, I'm yeah. jumping ahead again. So the wool buy. Go ahead. Can you yeah, explain that? Yeah. Yeah. So the wool buy. Uh, for the last several years, I've been working with uh, Navajo raised wools that a friend of mine sources direct from the Navajo Nation. And he, for years, has been going on this wool buy every June. And it sounds very, it always to me, sounded very mysterious. And I was like, oh, Teddy's going off to the wool buy again. Well, yeah, and, Navajo you know, wool buy. It yeah, definitely sounds mysterious. Yeah, it sounds mysterious. pretty exciting. Yeah. yeah, mysterious. And I was like, pretty exciting. <laughs> Um, but this past year I've been, um, working on a project sort of around the whole wool supply chain. So I was lucky to go on the wool by this past June and it's, um, it's an event that's in its, uh, I believe this, this year was the eighth year and it is about a week long and there's a coalition, you could say of commercial wool buyers and there's a couple Navajo sort of hosts or organizers, the Black Mesa Water Coalition, which is like a um, sort of environmental de- environmental justice um, organizing group uh, based in Navajo Nation. And the Diné College Land Grant Office, which is the sort of ag program of the Diné College. So they're kind of like the local organizers and hosts. And then these commercial wool buyers. And over the course of a week, we visited about eight different towns and in each town it's essentially just like a i mean it's kind of like a pop-up it's like set up tents and people so it's all individual producers and households who are selling their raw wool from the sheep that they raise and now that so it's not 
it's not like a pop up as though like there's products or the other no, pro- it's like a pop up purchasing site. Oh, it's a purchasing site, it's a, gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're it's just the reverse pop up. <laughs> yeah. So they're just on sacks of the yeah, of so the wool. yeah, so it it arose, um, you know, until the wool buy started, there were not really um, such great opportunities for people to sell their wool. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the time, like sort of the best bets were often at the trading posts, either in the reservation or on the border towns. And the price per pound that people were getting was not really commensurate with like the national price per pound of wool. So it was a okay. really depressed wool market. And there's a lot of wool being raised. Is there's there? this long history of, um, well, yeah, long history. And the Navajo, and, what states or what state? Uh, New Mexico, Arizona. Okay. Primarily, gotcha. primarily Arizona. Yeah. Uh, the, do the eight towns do they transfer state? I guess that's what I was. Yeah. So I remember looking at the map that you yeah. had, and it starts in New Mexico. We started goes, in New Mexico. And then it goes yeah. To Arizona. Yeah, we did a big loop, so we kind of okay. zigzagged a bunch, but yeah, gotcha. we did a big loop. Um, yeah, starting in uh, let's see. I think Crown Point, New Mexico, was the first site, and mm-hmm. then from there, just did yeah, big loop. Over eight days. So is this something that, all these towns. that bringing more focus to it is a good thing or a bad thing? Would you say? That's a good question. Um, to the wool buy. Yeah, to the wool buy. I think. Or to the wool industry, I guess in general. I think bringing more focus to the wool industry is definitely a positive thing. I think yeah. that there's, and I'm, I'm definitely just in the process of trying to learn more about it and mm-hmm. understand better because it's, it's, I mean, this is like commodity scale wool. You know, it's not. This is different than. Um, the stuff that I'm more familiar with seeing, which is kind of this like small batch artisanal spinning mills or mm-hmm. fiber processing mills that have been growing up in different parts of the country, which are wonderful. But this this buy is kind of happening at a, in a different scale and the volume of wool, like over the you know course of the buy this year, there was about 160,000 pounds purchased, which is like six and a half 50 foot trailers. So if you picture like six, picture seven like container trucks going down the highway like that's the amount of wool um that was moved over so the course the of that wool's different at each stop or mm-hmm. i guess what what makes yeah. the wools different at each stop obviously yeah. they had what the sheep eat does that yeah. matter too and or? a lot of it's the breeding and it's okay. you know from from person to person the sheep's different i mean i think there's some amount of like town to town maybe trends um and some of that's based on the landscape of mm-hmm. the different areas um mm-hmm. some of that like there's uh yeah there's one town where it's sort of like some of the wools sort of famously really burry because the landscape around there is really heavy in burrs hmm. um but yeah and, so and yeah what do they what what does wool go in mainly like you're talking about commercial sales or yeah. commercial buys yeah where, where does that well, commercial so, sold yeah. yeah so most of the wool that's getting purchased is getting purchased by a um, ohio-based wool cooperative so these wool pools or wool cooperatives um have existed in the u.s for a long time and it's basically like like any cooperative it's kind of like you know if you and i each raise 10 sheep we're gonna have a much better time selling the wool of 20 sheep right right and then splitting it as opposed to like each trying to whatever knock on the door of the spinner or whatever mm-hmm. so anyway so these wool <laughs> wool pools um and this one in ohio has has been around for over 100 years and it's essentially it is it's what it sounds like it's just a pool it's like a collection point for different producers to sell their wool so they buy most of the wool from the navajo buy and then they grade it so they sort it based on the type of wool like how um crimpy it is how thick it is how much hair there is like all these there's all these different sort of you know parameters for for grading wool and then they sell it to the next step down the line which is the scouring plant which is the washing that's where the wool gets washed and then from there it goes any number of places so depending on if it's a real fine wool or a coarse wool it might get sold to a spinning mill that will make yarn that will then become sweaters or outerwear or rugs or whatever Uh, uh, yeah okay so it's still it's I didn't really realize it makes sense, but I didn't realize this until I started working on this project is like, it's very rare that there's a single like lot of material that's like getting shepherded through the system by one company or person. It's kind of like each time there's a process that the material undergoes, it gets like bought and sold Mm -hmm. to the person who's doing that process. 
So are are so are you buying it? Are you buying the wool on a commercial scale, or how are you? I'm buying not buying that? any so wool. Just, okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like I wish I I wish I I wish I was sometimes, but yeah. no. I'm my so I work with Teddy. Teddy buys mohair, uh, which is the goat wool, and he buys some amount of wool, like sheep wool. And then he is like a yarn dealer and broker. So he then sort of moves it through the scouring, spinning process into yarn. Mm. And then I work with his yarns. So I'm not in a, at this point, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in it, but I think at this point more kind of trying to um, understand the mechanisms by which all this stuff works. Um, it sounds like a small community. Yeah, like a, a pretty small, not niche, but like a yeah, a small in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the wool. I mean, the wool industry. I think is. I mean, it has. I don't think. I no, it's shrunk a lot, a lot, a lot in the last like you know thirty years. Um, why is that, or why? Um, or do you, do you have any? Do yeah. you know any knowledge of why it happened? And I'm not saying that you caused it. But just, no, you're like, why did that happen? Well, why did you do that? No, uh, it's like it's like big. Um, is it is it the same story? Like the big the big man the big commercial takes it over, finds it for cheap somewhere else, and yeah, then I think it has a lot. Of, yeah, monetizes it, the whole thing. So yeah, yeah, and there's yeah, yes, um, and I think just the the what do you say the I'm blanking on this phrase the cost <laughs> cost benefit sort of like it just doesn't pay to rate like the the amount that people for people who are raising sheep like the you know the amount that you'll make on you know the wool a thousand pounds of wool is not um doesn't balance out yeah it doesn't balance out with like the input that you put into it and can sheep only be bred there or raised there i guess no there's sheep all over the country okay so why is it only that well they so the nav the navajo thing um or the navajo buy is i you know the wool broker or the wool people are buying wool all over the country mostly in the midwest the navajo buy is just one outlet or one sort of point at which these commercial people are buying wool okay um and i got involved with that largely because um of this relationship working relationship i had with um this yarn dealer who works with that stuff Mm -hmm. and so for me it became this thing about sort of trying to understand the material that i work with Mm -hmm. and trace it through its not only just kind of like trace it through the supply chain, but also kind of try to understand a little bit more, a lot more hopefully about like the histories of all of these materials Mm -hmm. and, um, and try to sort of use like the textiles that I weave, like with this yarn that is sourced from the Navajo nation. I've been making blankets and scarves and some moving into some apparel stuff and upholstery fabrics. And it's really important to me and has become like a, yeah, sort of project about kind of fleshing out the long and complicated and often pretty horrendous like story of that material. Um, And the his like sort of as like a, you know, whatever material Mm. thing that can sort of help us see something about. Yeah. So US on your, history. On your yeah. presentation that you gave, I mean, are yeah. you using a, uh, the same presentation you used for Textile Week? Or how did you prepare for that? Or what did you? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Did you see the Textile Week? I did you believe, come to that? Yeah. yeah okay. Yep. Well, this was a lot longer. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> and I've done more research since then. So, so are it was... you laying everything out? Or are you storyboard, storyboarding it? Or how did you come up with the presentation as far as format? That's or how such did you a great walk, question. Walk them through it. Yeah. Because that's something I've been really been struggling with with this project is like how to organize it. Because yeah. it's really sprawling. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's kind of like the thing, you know, I'm interested in. I think it's, I'm fascinated by like the sort of contemporary, just like supply chain stuff. Well, like what happened, you know, when it's at the wool graders, Mm -hmm. like what, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. what does it look like and how does it get (laughs) packed and what do the machines look like and who works there and like all of that stuff. (laughs) But then every, this is where my sort of history nerd comes in is like at each of those places, I see it as this sort of like, you know, a a node that you can take a thousand different tangents off of Mm -hmm. and use that as sort of like a a vehicle or a lens or whatever for like sort of, you know, grounding something about like, well, why is it that all of these industries in the U S have 
have faded Absolutely. and what does that mean about like global trade mm -hmm. um and what does that mean about how we value and like how money works and commodities work um yeah. and so yeah so in terms of how to organize it i think you know in that presentation i i took it mostly chronologically in terms of like through my sort of present day research, like supply chain research, kind yeah. of, you know, these are the steps that the material moves through and then try to use those points as sort of make logical connections of like, oh, this is a good moment to talk about the history so, of sheep in the Navajo Nation or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Did you take a different opportunity with the uh, Chicago Textile Week? Because obviously you're talking to an audience that knows textiles yeah. and did you maybe skip some steps whereas at the grand foundation like sure they're creative and sure they know yeah a little bit more but did you take time to like maybe explain like you were saying yeah. explain the history of it more what, what did you think became more extensive in that um or what message what story what tangent did you go off of yeah that's a good question i think on the on this longer presentation you know i'm i'm in the process of trying to figure out how this material gets organized and transmitted. And I'd like to, I, I see that as like a book and I see that as an, mm -hmm. perhaps like an exhibition or something. And so for at the Graham foundation, it was really like, I've just been like swimming in the soup of research for the last like <laughs> eight months of like reading and, you know, doing these like site visits and taking pictures and trying to sort of write more free form about what I'm collecting. And then mm -hmm. it was like this big, yeah, soup of like, well, how do you, you can't just like throw soup at people. It's not going to stick. Won't uh, stick. Won't stick or it will. Simple science, but yeah, right. <laughs> and they don't want it to. Um, yeah, so so then I'm not really answering your question. But, no, 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 this is great. This is, um, these are all thoughts, then, and I would, you know, I'm more interested in how you presented and, yeah. and how you communicated the story yeah. of the, the wool yeah. buy and of, of your history. Well, I feel like with the, the Textile Week talk, which was maybe 15 or 20 minutes, that was really about sort of, I felt like it was a two-part thing where I was introducing the weaving mill and talking about the programs that we do and what happens there, mm -hmm. and then really talking about the wool buy and getting into like the nitty-gritty of the wool by itself and i don't remember if i'd been to the grading place in that talk but time wise in, oh in, i think i had in I, ohio yeah okay I had. so you did make a trip down there yeah gotcha. yeah 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 um i spent a couple of days there in august um but i feel like at the graham talk i was really i was trying i think i was trying my first trying my hand for sort of for the first time publicly at this idea of like each step in the supply chain is a node. And then from there we can take these tangents, you know? So mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. yeah. And then our, I mean, obviously the presentation is always going to evolve and you're always yeah. going to kind of go back to it. So are you going to continue to kind of present that or document I, the, yeah. the, are you going back to the, I'm assuming you're going back to the Navajo and yeah. Jay. Yeah. 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 Are, what are some steps now that you've been there? Like, are you prepping for that or? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, last year my approach was like, I'm going, I'm going to, I was both like working it and just in the sense of like being extra hands mm -hmm. and packing bags or loading stuff or doing whatever. Um, and documenting like taking photographs and just kind of talking to people, but not like sitting down and interviewing people. Mm -hmm. It's really just trying to, take a very uh i guess sort of participant kind of uh approach and so now that i have at least some framework of understanding kind of like the the wool by itself where it came from what some of the con a little bit of the context is um my next step is to well i have two sort of two a forward step and a backward step in terms of like chronology but um I'm planning on making a trip out to the scouring plant this spring to see what that is about and talk to some of the people there because that is really the point at which the wool starts to enter like a broader market mm -hmm. and we can start seeing the connection more to like the finished objects that it's going to become. Mm -hmm. And then the backwards chronology step is spending a little bit of time um, outside of the wool by in the Navajo Nation interviewing the folks who are involved in it. Mm -hmm. um, so the organizers um, and then some of the producers and other people that I met last year, just getting when we're not like packing a bag, like actually sitting down and right. talking to people right. about what they, what they think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first I, I didn't even shout out uh, Diana and Stephanie from the collective for hosting us beautifully in the HBF as we keep talking about textiles and, and the beautiful textiles that they have. Um, how much 
how much textiles do you think you produce out of the the weaving mill or what what types of oh well, that's a good question what types of variations do you do would you produce out of there well i mean because it's it a really, ra- it's a it really depends right yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like well every six months uh i don't know i mean the like i don't actually know like our total like the total and volume what are the of streets? yards sorry what are the streets because a lot of people may not know where actually the weaving mill is so. oh it's um uh it's right off of the 606 trail in chicago on spalding so it's like spalding and Cortland. okay yeah okay yeah around kedzie and north mm-hmm. yeah um okay so volume oh you, you, it, you don't really know or it's hard to kind of gauge it's hard to gauge i mean i could sit, sit I, i've thought i'd like to do this actually calculate go back how many yards we've woven all together um in the last five years but um it again it really fluctuates like we have some a, a handful of kind of like regular clients um where there's like a, a standard fabric that i make for them and mm-hmm. we you know do it in 20 yard increments um and so they'll you know send out 20 yards every two months or something um I mean, on average, the the length of warp that I'm working is usually around 160 yards. I don't know. I mean, this fall, I guess I put on a bunch of warps. Probably wove like 400 yards yeah. in a couple months. Yeah, two months. And you have a yeah. recycling or a green story about it too. Like, do what do you do with the runoff? I don't know what it's called. The yeah, runoff, it's but. all. It's, <laughs> it, uh, it's nothing. All, nothing gets thrown away. Nothing gets thrown away. We do right? a lot of material saving and uh, reusing, and a lot of a lot of the you know when we started we um inherited a lot of the yarn from chicago weaving so that is a yarn that is it's one of those things where you're like okay there's these 10 colors that i never would have chosen but how do i combine them and work with them and you know find their strengths um so we do a lot with like sort of dead stock or recycled not recycled so much technically but dead stock dead stock or um odd lots of yarns and then design projects around Mm-hmm. around those mm-hmm. yeah any uh any events coming up in that that we should know about as that's far a good as, question uh, anything uh, <clears throat> no any new products coming up well yep got a new some new napkin colorways coming up pretty soon Very some new cool. blankets yes they're going to be on the website in the next week or so yes so check it out yes um uh, but yeah we have open houses nothing on the books at the moment but we have a mailing list or instagram mm-hmm. you want to check it out yeah 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 well uh thank you i mean that was about it i just Great. wanted to uh bring you on and talk about textiles Alex, thank you so much yeah no problem You're a champ. um where can they follow you on instagram or it's website the weaving so instagram is just at the weaving mill okay it's very direct perfect and then the website is <laughs> weavingmill.com oh branding <laughs> yep <laughs> keep it clean and uh there's a we have a newsletter called the weaving mail oh little pun yep i like it yeah i like it well Great. thank you again thank and, you felix um, we'll be talking soon in what a, a pleasure few months so thank, thank you, you so much Your safety is important if you observe unattended packages vandalism or suspicious activity inform cta personnel immediately